Dear guests, welcome to the 13th seminar of our series, Historians and the War, Rethinking the Future. This time we have a special guest, Professor Timothy Garden Ash. But first, a small, a short technical announcement. The seminar today will last about one hour. At the end, there will be time for a Q&A section where questions from the audience will be discussed. So if you have, a que if you have questions for our guests, please write them down in the chat during the seminar and they will be read at the end. As always, the seminar is being recorded and will be later published on the YouTube channel, the German-Ukrainian Historians Commission. I will post the link to the channel and our partner institutions into the chat during the webinar. The language of today's webinar is English with a simultaneous translation into Ukrainian. If you want to hear the translation, please click on the icon with the globe at the right bottom of the screen. Thank you for your patience. Now I pass the word on to Natalia Hanenko Friesen. Thank you, Georgi. Uh, dear participants, dear attendees, wherever you are connecting with us from whatever part of the world, we're very happy to be with you today, and especially we're very pleased to host such an esteemed guest as Dr. Gardnash. Um, Russian war against Ukraine is an assault on Ukraine's sover sovereignty, democracy, people, and, and they're very right to exist as an independent nation. The war has already severely, severely undermined the global order, international security, democratic order and peace, really international relations, food security around the world, and, and undermine severely the economic stability as we know it. And as in the context of this ongoing war, historians and other humanities, humanities and social sciences do have a professional responsibility and they do face the need to address important questions which are we all struggling and coupling with. What are the very foundations upon the global and European history and our understanding of it should be built as we are going forward? The Russian war in Ukraine forces us to rethink the 20th century empires and nation states, regimes and ideologies, the way we remember the past, our national memory cultures, the way we understand the World War II, the genocide, mass crime, crimes against humanity, and so on and so forth. And looking forward, how should we conceive of this past? How should we, should we understand the history from the vantage point of today, which itself is shifting, itself is changing, given the uncertainty in which we are living. After all, the war has already spilled into 2023. Thus, with this idea in mind and recognizing that we face this need and responsibility, three international partners formed the joint initiative, Historians and the War uh, Rethinking the Future. The series are co-hosted by the German-Ukrainian Historians Commission, the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies, the Ukraine-based scholarly journal, Ukraina Moderna, the Department of Eastern European History at Munich University, and the Ukrainian Catholic University. We also want to thank the German Academic Exchange Service, GAD, for the support of the series with the funds of the German Foreign Ministry and the German Federal Minister of Education and Research. With this being said, I would like to pass on the torch of hosting this event to Dr. Martin Schulze-Wessel, who will be moderating uh, and then uh, introducing our speaker. Thank you. Uh, dear Natalia, thank you very much for, for stressing the idea of our series. And welcome to everybody. Uh, welcome especially to the Ukrainian colleagues and guests of our seminar. And a very warm welcome to Timothy garten Ash. Uh, we are delighted, uh, Timothy, that you accepted our invitation to the seminar. Uh, it's great to have you here. Um, Timothy garten Ash does not need an introduction. I think uh, all of us will know him. He's a professor of European studies at, at Oxford University and a fellow of St. Anthony's College. His main interest is the history, the contemporary history of Central and East Central Europe, and especially the transformation of Central Europe we are witnessing since the 1980s. Um, 
he, he's the author of many books and, and I cannot uh, read the list of the books, but I want to especially uh, to name the Magic Return, the revolution of 1989 um, witnessed in Warsaw, Budapest, Prague and Berlin, which uh, Timothy Garten Esch published in 1990 which is a fascinating book about a thorough analysis, uh, but also a very good description of what happened in 1999 and, and uh, in the 1980s generally. And, and the second book I would like to mention is the book Free Speech, uh, 10, 10 Principles for uh, Connecting Connected World, which was published with Yale University Press in 2016. Timothy Garten Ash uh, has been awarded with many prizes. Let me just mention the Charles Magnier Prize, which he was, he was awarded in 2017, I think. And uh, last not least, I would like to say that he is contributing to many newspapers and media, uh, to The Guardian, for example, to the New York Review of Books, to German newspapers. Indeed, he has an audience, of course, in Britain, but also in Poland, in Hungary, in, in Germany. And, and this is, um, I, I think, uh, very unique uh, to be an intellectual who is not only translated into different languages, but who is influencing the public sphere in, in Europe indeed. And so we are very happy to have you here and to have you today in a discussion uh, in a German, Canadian, Ukrainian framework. The floor is yours, Tim. Thank you very much, Martin and Natalia. It's a great pleasure to be with you today. Uh, and I'm only sorry that uh, Yaroslav Herzak can't be with us. Um, what, I, what I'm going to do in the next 20, maybe maximum 25 minutes, is to give you a, a highly abridged version of the lecture I had the great pleasure of giving uh, at the Ukrainian Catholic University in Lviv. Uh, last month in December, which is itself a highly abbreviated version of one thread of argument in my new book, Homelands, A Personal History of Europe, which is also coming out in Germany in the spring under the title Europa eine persönliche Geschichte. Um, it, it's a very unusual book, like, like several I've written, because it's contemporary history illustrated by memoir and reportage. But it has several threads of argument, and one of them is summed up in my title, From Post-War Europe to Post-Wall Europe and Back. Post-War Europe to Post-Wall, i.e. post-1989 Europe and back. And I want to give you just the, the, the bare bones of the argument and then suggest a few lessons from history in thinking about Ukraine in Europe today. So my book is very much in conversation with a book you will all know, which is Tony Judd's Post-War, a history of Europe from 1945 until the early 2000s. Tony's title, Post-War, has two meanings, an obvious one and a less obvious one. The obvious one is after the Second World War, after 1945. The less obvious one is after war. That is to say the story of a Europe that sets out never again to have wars, nie wieder, to be a continent of peace. Now, the notion that Europeans abhorred and abjured war would have been surprising news to people in many parts of the world. Uh, in Indochina, in Algeria, in Malaysia, in Kenya, in Angola, and Mozambique, because in all these places, West European colonial powers were fighting fierce wars to defend their empires well into the mid-1970s. It would also, of course, have been surprising news 
to people in Central and Eastern Europe behind the Iron Curtain, where armed conflict continues into the late 1940s. Then you have the Soviet invasion of Hungary, 56, Czechoslovakia, 68, Stan Wojenny in Poland, literally a state of war in Poland. And so it's really only in the post-war period, post-1989, that we move into a post-war period in a more fundamental sense. I remember meeting somebody, an East Berliner, walking down a street in East Berlin the day after the Berlin Wall came down. And he said to me very excitedly, this is in that book Martin mentioned, The Magic Lantern, he'd just seen a handwritten poster which said, only today is the war really over. And in a fundamental sense, I think that is true for East Europeans, objectively, because the major armies of the superpowers and nuclear arsenals retreated, at least from the center of Europe, and you had the peace settlement that we hadn't had in 1945, but also subjectively, because you had a generation of leaders in Europe who thought we really could move to post-war in Tony Judd's second sense, who believed that politics was now mainly about economics, who believed that security could be achieved by non-military means, who believed if you had to have defense, it was mainly going to be about non-state actors, because we were never going to have a major interstate war in Europe, were we? And who believed that economic interdependence would underpin what people hoped would be a perpetual peace. So it's actually great to have massive energy dependence on Russia, because that's going to underpin peace. And gradually people persuaded themselves that we were indeed moving towards Immanuel Kant's perpetual peace, forgetting the old Russian proverb that perpetual peace lasts until the next war. Now, there are many things that underpin this story, but one I want to highlight is what I call a historiosophical mistake. Because I think at a deep level, what explains this mistake was that people came to believe that the way history had gone was the way history would continue to go. Or to put it a different way, that history, this only works in English, history with a small a, uh, as the interaction between structural factors, long-term processes, and contingency, fortuna, choices, the role of the individual in history, was history with a capital H. History as a Hegelian process of an in in inevitable march forward towards more freedom and more democracy. Whereas, of course, Actually, what happened in Europe between 1989 and 1991 was a one in a million example of historical luck. I mean, if you look at it, it's an extraordinary example of how multiple contingent developments in the Soviet Union, in the United States, in Western Europe, in Eastern Europe, all converge to make what happened in 1989 possible. Now, at this point, some of you will say, aha, Francis Fukuyama, the end of history. Um, I don't believe that this mistake was made so much in the end of history moment in the early to mid 1990s, because actually, those of you who remember that period will know that it was a period of great uncertainty. None of us knew whether the transition to democracy and market economies could succeed anywhere in post-communist Europe. The joke, as you remember, was, we know that you can turn an aquarium into fish soup, but can you turn fish soup back into an aquarium? And in Europe too, most of the great projects had not been completed. Some of them had not been started. The single market had not yet been completed. The euro had not yet been started. Schengen had not actually come into existence. The great enlargement was 15 years away. So actually, and by the way, we had five wars in former Yugoslavia. 
So how are we going to talk about post-war when you have war going on in Yugoslavia? So that in my view, the moment where the historiosophical mistake kicks in, or to put it another way, hubris, is not the early 1990s. It's the early to mid 2000s, when everything seemed to have gone so well, when we seemed to have made the transition to democracy in East Central Europe, when we had the Euro and it seemed to be working well, when we'd done the big eastward enlargement and so on and so forth. And then it is that hubris sets in. The hubris of the United States, believing it's a unipolar moment, the new Rome can do anything, the hubris of Tony Blair's Cool Britannia, the hubris of my friends in East Central Europe who believe Poland and Hungary were already consolidated democracies, the hubris of the Eurozone, the hubris of believing that the rest of the world had only graciously to follow the European example. Mark Leonard's book title, Why Europe Will Run the 21st Century, and the hubris of globalized financialized capitalism which believed that aggregate global gains would compensate for local losses. So in my periodization, what we have is an upward turn in European history, which starts in 1985, the election of Gorbachev, Delors becomes president of the European Commission, Reagan goes into his second term in the United States, um, dissident movements in Eastern Europe, particularly in Poland, start sketching out a strategy for transition and then peaks in 1989. And what I call the downward turn in East European history starts about 2005 and peaks from 2008 on. So 2005, the French and the Dutch reject the European Constitutional Treaty and referendums. 2007, Vladimir Putin declares war on the West at the Munich Security Conference. And then 2008, you have this confluence of two separate highly negative developments. The global financial crisis, which segues into the Eurozone crisis and the Great Recession, and Georgia the seizure by Vladimir Putin of Abkhazia and South Ossetia, which starts a whole other history in uh, Eastern Europe. From then on, we have a series of blows to the European project from the Eurozone crisis to populism, the erosion of democracy in Hungary, which begins in 2010. In Poland, it begins in 2015 the refugee crisis, of course, 2014, crucially, the seizure, the annexation of Crimea in the beginning of the war in eastern Ukraine, the refugee crisis, Brexit, Trump, COVID, all the way down to the 24th of February, 2022, and the beginning of the largest war in Europe since 1945. And I'm going to put it to you, this is a risky proposition because it's always risky to make early statements about turning points in history. But I'm going to put it to you. Oh, and let me just say one thing before going to this. One or two of you might say, well, what about 9-11? Wasn't 9-11 a major watershed in the history of the last 30 years? Interestingly enough, Looking back over this whole period, I think it is much less of a watershed in European history than we thought at the time. Actually, um, the only really major way in which it affects European history is how it changed the United States and launching the United States into a, a decade of strategic distraction and the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. But I don't believe 9-11 is actually a major watershed, the turning point in post-1989 European history, which is a warning against doing what I'm now just about to do, which is to suggest that I think future historians may think that the post-wall period, the period 
that I've been talking about begins on the 9th of November, 1989 and ends on the 24th of February, 2022. I think we can risk the claim that that is now a closed period. Um, of course, as I've tried to suggest, um, there was already a faltering effect. And, and the last period of my book, 2008, 2022, is headed faltering, which starts in 2008. So if you like, that was the beginning of the end of the post-war period. But I think the definitive end is the beginning of the full-scale invasion of uh, Ukraine, that finally puts paid to the illusion of the post-war period, which I've been talking about, which was still very much present up to just before the invasion. Um, we once again have a major war in Europe. By the way, we also have new walls in Europe because in response to the refugee crisis, instead of walls being pulled down, countries like Hungary and Poland and Lithuania have started to build new walls. Uh, against the refugees. But it's also the end of the post-war period because I think we can say that we come full circle in this sense. That of course, if the putsch in the Soviet Union had succeeded in August, 1991, then the empire striking back is what we would have experienced already at that time. So what didn't happen so to speak, at the beginning of the post-war period in August 1991 has happened 21 years later. And that's not just me speaking, because the guy who, as you all know, has just been notionally demoted as commander of Russian forces in the war in Ukraine, General Sergei Sorovikin, the butcher of Aleppo, was a putschist in August 1991. And um, Yevgeny Prigozhin, the head of the Wagner Group, welcomed his appointment on Telegram with the following words, I quote, Surovikin didn't have time to get all of his ammunition into his tank in August 1991. If he had, we'd be living in a totally different country, one 10 times more powerful. So, it, it's the end of the period, but it's also a coming full circle. Now, let me in the last few minutes before I throw this open for Q&A, because um, at Martin's urging, I'm going to be brief to allow more time for discussion. Take this forward and think about a few lessons from history from the story I've tried, tried to tell in telegraphic brevity, but also lessons from history for the current moment. So there are some general lessons, like don't make the historiosophical mistake. Don't ever believe that you know which way history is going. Don't extrapolate. Don't ever think of history as a Hegelian process um, predetermined. Uh, always watch out for hubris. It's just when you think things are going really well that things will start going wrong. But there are also a couple of specific lessons which relate specifically to Ukraine. And let me just touch on those for a moment. There's a fantastic essay by the great German historian Reinhard Kosselle, which in the English version is called the unknown future and the art of prognosis. And as it suggests, it's all about the possibility or impossibility of prediction. And one of the telling points that Koselek makes is a very, very simple point, which is that the more recurrent a phenomenon is in history, the more possible it is going to be to make probabilistic statements about the future. So for example, the statement, we're all gonna die, can be made with considerable confidence because in a vast historical data set, there's no instance to the contrary. 
revolutions, wars, dynasties, what happens to people who stay long in power. These are recurrent phenomena, pandemics too, by the way, a recurrent phenomena which make it easier to make probabilistic statements about the future. And of course, another such phenomenon is empires. Their rise, their decline, their fall, and the way in which they push back against their fall. So if I go back to the 1970s and 80s, when I started writing about Central and Eastern Europe, I had the great good fortune to come to the Soviet bloc from studying history and geographically from the periphery. And so I was able to see the Soviet bloc as an empire, which is of course what it was. Many people who came to the study of the Soviet bloc through political science and through Moscow didn't see it as an empire. They saw it as something different in history. And so they didn't see what was clear to me that this was an empire in decay. I actually wrote an essay in the New York Review in I think 1988 called The Empire in Decay. We, could, we couldn't know when it would fall, but we could see the trend of the development. And then when it did fall, so unexpectedly, so miraculously, so peacefully in 1989 to 1991, many people thought, that's it, it's over. This centuries old, largest remaining land empire in Europe has just softly and suddenly vanished away. But if one thought about it as an empire and knew the history of empires, then you know we Brits know this, the French know this, the Portuguese know this, that imperial powers don't give up their empires without a struggle. They try to hang on to them, and if they've lost them, they try to get them back. Think about all those colonial wars, West European colonial wars between 1945 and 1975. Um, so, of course, that's precisely what we've seen. Transnistria already. 1992. I met Vladimir Putin when he was still deputy mayor of St. Petersburg at a basically German-Russian conference in 1994. And this rather unpleasant little man, nobody took any notice of him. Few people knew who he was, deputy mayor, sidekick of Sobchak. Um, and right at the end of the conference, the Bergedorfer Gesprächskreis, he suddenly piped up. And he said, we must remember that there are territories that have, I quote, always been Russian, which are now outside the Russian Federation. And he mentioned specifically Crimea. And he said, there are people who are, quote, Russians who are outside the Russian Federation, and we have a duty to protect them. 1994, five years before NATO enlargement. Don't tell me that NATO enlargement was responsible for the attack on Ukraine. If we had thought about it this way, then when Georgia happened in 2008, we would have understood what was going on, which is the empire strikes back and would have reacted much more strongly and would already have started to think about our energy dependence on Moscow. And above all, 2014, the turning point at which the West fails to return, then we would have seen this really is the beginning of the neo-colonial pushback and we would have started to prepare for the conflict that we now face. So think about empires, learn that lesson from history, and we would have been in a much better place today. The second point, which also relates to empires, is a point I take from Gwendolyn Sasser's excellent little book, The the War Against Ukraine, published by Tseha Beck, um, where she says very forcefully that the West in general, but Germany in particular, has to decolonize its view of Eastern Europe.
it's a rather peculiar version of decolonization of the mind. Because if we said the Brits or the French have to decolonize their thinking, it would be they are still thinking through the lens of their own empire. In the case of this claim, which is that the West in general, but Germany in particular, has to decolonize its view of Eastern Europe, the empire in question is the Russian empire. In other words, Germans are seeing Eastern Europe through the lens of the Russian Empire. I recall the article by Schmidt in October 2014, when he famously said, until 1990, no one doubted that Ukraine belonged to Russia, and went on to say, Ukraine is now, 2014, an independent state, but not a nation state. A classic example of the need for for decolonization. And um, I believe that the war in Ukraine has having a massively catalytic effect on the decolonization of, so to speak, the Western mind and particularly the German mind in relation to Eastern Europe. This is something, may I say, which many historians, German and histor Ukrainian historians, people like you, Martin, Andreas Umland, so he plucky in the English speaking word, Tim Snyder, Yaroslav Herzak, many, many others have been working on for years. Um, and, and by the way, let me also say that I think historians have played a particularly positive role in the German debate around the war in Ukraine and other experts, the German experts on, on Russia and Eastern Europe. But clearly the war in Ukraine has made a quantum leap in the perception of Ukraine as an independent, strong, united European nation with a past and a future of its own. And this brings me to my very final point before going into discussion. Um, and this is something that I've just actually finished writing about in an essay for the New York Review of Books, which is coming out to coincide with the the first anniversary of the full-scale invasion. And this is that the prize that can flow from a Ukrainian victory in this war and an implementation of the promise made by the European Union to enlarge to include Ukraine Moldova and Georgia, as well as the Western Balkans. And by the way, in my view, what follows from that is also a day from the NATO powers, and eventually, logically, in the end, uh, also NATO membership. Uh, by the way, NATO and EU are now closer together, so to speak, the two strong arms of, of democratic Europe that what follows from that is the possibility that we have for the first time ever in European history a genuinely post-imperial Europe. That is to say a Europe which no longer has empires either overseas, colonial empires, or land empires. Uh, on our own continent. And that would be an extraordinary prize uh, and an extraordinary, is an extraordinary historic opportunity uh, to move forward towards something which one could genuinely call a Europe whole and free. And with that, Martin, let me um, finish and I look forward to the conversation. Thank you, Timothy, so much for this uh, really great talk and, and very thoughtful paper. Uh, and, and I regret very much, I must say, that Yaroslav is not with us. We plan to discuss it together. And uh, I would like to ask Gilinada and, and Natalia and others to, to, uh, to, to contribute to the discussion. Um, I mean, there are many questions you raised, and, and uh, of course, the most interesting question is what 
follows for the future from, from, from your thoughts about the period since 1989, uh, but maybe we can keep this for, for the second part of the discussion. Um, I found also very interesting the periodization of European history or maybe of world history uh, from 1989 to the 24th of February in 2022. Um, I mean, we always thought that um, history is already global history and this periodization you proposed is a history which begins in Europe and has its second turning point again in Europe. Whereas 9-11 was of course a global event. And uh, isn't this amazing? What would you say uh, the really um, important things are happening in, in Europe in this time still? Or would you say it's a history of Europe? Is, is it a global history which is taking place in Europe or is it a European history just? Well, that's a fascinating question, Martin. I, I, I mean, maybe um, what this is telling us is that history is still not so, so to speak, um, uh, 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 systematically and profoundly global as many have believed. Um, um, that's not a case against doing global history, but nonetheless, um, you know, a couple of points. First of all, clearly we are experiencing some, have experienced since 2008, some elements of deglobalization. So in some sense of processes, if you look at the way in which China now has its own entirely its own information environment, uh, its own internet, there's a Chinese internet and a Western internet, and increasingly its own separate economy that is in a sense reversing the trend of globalization. So that's point number one. Point number two, of course, if I were writing American history, 9-11 um, would figure very large indeed. I mean, 2008 would be significant too, 2014 much less so. So maybe it is indeed a case that we are still in a world where there are different histories. I mean, the last quick point to make is of course that in the wider world, we're moving into a post-Western world of great powers and middle powers pursuing their own interests and ambitions. Um, so, 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 so whereas Europe in a sense is going against that trend and still having a tendency towards integration and a, a, a post-imperial future, um, the wider world in a sense is going in the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. um, I found also, let me just follow up with one other question. I found also very interesting your reflection on post-war that it has a double meaning, this obvious meaning and the deeper meaning uh, of never again, ni vida, krieg, never again war. Um, and well, when, when I was at Oxford, uh, at, I had the impression that the German discourse and, and the English discourse on war and this uh, never again is quite different. Uh, in, in, it, it seems to me the, that this um, imperative that there should never be a war again is deeply rooted in, in the German discourse and that this is one, uh, one origin of uh, German failure to, to conceive what happened in, in Russia and to react uh, to it uh, in time. Uh, would you say this never again is really a European reaction to 1945 or would you say it's a more a German one? So point number one, I, I think the, the impulse of never again is shared by 
all those who went through the first and particularly the Second World War. So that the wartime generation, someone like Harold Macmillan, for example, who fought in the First World War, his motive for supporting European integration was very much that. That was true of Edward Heath. It's true of my father's generation. So I think at that level, it is a, a shared feature right across Europe. Um, however, what we see in the different national reactions to the war in Ukraine is how important different national memories of war are, right? Mm. So the Brits and the Poles say, hey, there's a war on against a tyrant. We've got to get in there and fight the good fight, right? Because that's our lesson from the Second World War. We've got to stand up to tyranny and fight for freedom. And I mean, I don't want to oversimplify, but much more of a reaction in Germany, but also to some extent in Italy, um, would be heavens above, we just have to stop this war at any cost because the most important thing is Frieden. And by the way, Frieden is not simply a translation of the English word peace. It has its own particular connotations. Mm -hmm. I think there'd be a great essay to be written on the meanings of Frieden in, 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 in post-1945 Germany. And my problem with that is that if you take peace simply understood, and this is a point that Václav Havel made, as the absence of outright hot war, right? Mm -hmm as the Trump card, the thing that trumps everything. You remember Egon Barr, peace is not everything, but without peace, there is nothing. Um, then you simply give in. You simply give in to dictators and to aggressors because you say, we just have to stop this war at any cost. And if that means capitulation, but of course the capitulation and surrender is being done by others, not by people in Dusseldorf or Dortmund or Frankfurt. So I think there is actually a real problem with the discourse around peace, specifically Frieden, uh, in contemporary Germany. Mm -hmm. uh, no, I, I th thank you, Timothy. I, I would like to bring in one question from the audience. It's uh, Alina um, Dobroshevska who asks, even if Russia loses the war, which I hope will happen, and I think we all hope, what can be done to make the Russian people understand and fully take responsibility for the aggression and violence perpetrated by their hands, rather than reasserting themselves in the paradigm of a victim invaded by the collective West, using Ukraine as the aggressor? This is what state propaganda tells Russians. What is your opinion on this subject? Thank you. It's a great question. And uh, one cannot be optimistic, because if you think about the model of Geschichtsaufarbeit, about dealing with the past, which is West Germany, first you have defeat, then you have occupation, then you have quite a long period where Germans are on the whole talking about their own victimhood, the Vertreibungen. Remember, Martin Broschak started working on the expulsions of Germans from the east of Europe. And only then, with all those prior conditions, do you get an exemplary Geschichtsaufarbeit on confrontation with the past. Now, those conditions are not going to be fulfilled in the Russian case for a very, very long time. So I fear it's going to take an extremely long time before you have a confrontation with the past in Russia. And what I think we can do, um, number one, have something like a truth commission. I mean, a really scrupulous historical invention, an enquête commission, if you like, so that you have an authoritative documentation. Number two, find cleverer ways of reaching Russian society, right? Um, uh, through social media, through online media, so that we are actually getting the message through. And by the way, I think we should keep our ties on the whole with Russian universities and Russian cultural institutions because it's really important to keep communicating with you know, a new generation of, 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 of Russians. Um, 
so 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 that those would be, I think, the two two big things to start with. And then geopolitically, my answer is for the next few years, our Russian policy, our Ukrainian policy is our Russian policy, right? So we work indirectly for change in Russia. And only after Putin goes, nobody knows how or when, um, can one start of thinking about a more direct engagement on these issues um, with a new leadership in, in Moscow. Mm -hmm. uh, may I return to your to your uh, presentation and to your observation in 1989 that Russia was or the Soviet Union was an empire in decay. I mean, from this observation follows, of course, that there will be a struggle to recover the empire. And uh, well, what, what is your suggestion about the future? Um, could one say that these struggles are normally not successful? Um, Arne Westad, the apropos global history, the author of a very fine global history of the Cold War, is now working on empires. And um, his argument is indeed, he's looking at comparative empires. And his argument is indeed that neo-colonial wars, struggles, attempts at recolonization generally are unsuccessful. That once you've lost it, on the whole, you've lost it, mm. right? But then of course, it takes a very, very long time to accept that you have actually lost it, uh, which is I think where Russia clearly is at the moment. The other point I would make is that Britain and France, when we, if I may say we, lost our empires, we had classic nation states to go back to, right? There was, there was a centralized English nation state in the 16th century with a privy council and a monarchy and a parliament and the Supreme mm -hmm. Court and so on. So we had something to go back to as the French did, whereas you know, as you know better than me, there isn't something like that for Russia to go back to. There's just Muscovy. So I think that makes it even more difficult mm. for Russia to, you know, to, to use the phrase that was applied to Britain by Dean Asherson, lose an empire and find a role. Mm. Maybe Russia should go back to Novgorod and not to Moscow, <laughs> not, not to repeat something. <laughs> Um, uh, I just have to ask uh, Georgi, are there other questions in the chat? You could uh, maybe you could bring them in. Hmm? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, there's one question from um, Pittsburgh. Thank you for a very insightful talk. Given your historian's long experience and collaboration with Polish historians, the Zönungsarbeit, the Russian Ukrainian reconciliation after the war, and whether you see the role of Polish German historians in these processes. Thank you. Um, so, as one or two of you will know, I spent quite a few years writing a history of German Ostpolitik, so I actually looked into this in considerable detail. Um, and I would say a couple of things. One is I think it's difficult for the relations between historians to be totally detached from the larger political context, right? I think to some extent, historians, intellectuals, people in cultural life can be pioneers, but but the general, it has to be with a general direction of political development. So that if you look at the Polish German case, it was in the context of detente that the Polish German uh, commission worked. Um, and, and so I, I think it's gonna be difficult, even if it's desirable to do while you have an outright war, uh, while you still have Putin in the Kremlin, but at a certain point, I think it would be highly desirable to get that conversation going again. The second point I would make is, 
I don't think it's necessarily a desirable thing to try and have an agreed version of history because that tends to be, if you like, history with the history left out. All the most difficult things tend to be mm. vulgarized and neutralized and compromised formulas are fine. So I think it's very important to have these conversations between historians that I don't think you necessarily want to make at least your proximate goal, a single sort of synthesized agreed version of that history. Mm. And and I think we are far from it at the moment. <laughs> I think you could say yeah. that again. Yeah. yeah. But but I do think I can I just say again I do think mm -hmm. and Martin you and I have talked about this uh, as you know we have a project here called Europe in a Changing World, mm -hmm. uh, which has partnerships with universities in China, Turkey, India, US, and we have a partnership with the Higher School of Economics in Moscow, and we've kept that partnership going because mm -hmm. I don't think we should punish Russian students who. I'm sure most of them totally opposed to this war for what Vladimir Putin is doing. And I think it's really important to keep the channels of communication with open, open to them, also so they can hear the other point of view. Because if we mm -hmm. cut off all these channels of communication, and I think that's a lesson from the Cold War, then not, they'll only hear the one side, they'll only hear the propaganda. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's still another comparative question from Boris Roshin. Uh, is the US an empire? Uh, while the US is situated on the other side of the globe, is so invested in assisting peaceful Ukraine? Great question. I mean, look, how long do we have to talk about the definition of empires? But I would say in shorthand, yes, it's, a, it's an informal empire, but what it clearly is, is still a global power. And I think the answer to your question, why it's so engaged, and long may it remain so, by the way, because the biggest danger to Ukraine uh, from the Western side is a victory for Donald Trump in 2024. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think it's two things. I think it's what I'd said about historical narrative and self-understanding that like the Brits and the Poles, people in the United States instinctively say, we've got to get in there. There are people fighting for democracy against tyranny, against the aggressor. We must fight the good fight. And then of course, there are very real geopolitical interests because, you know, looked at quite cynically, what Ukrainian's heroic army is doing is massively degrading Russia's armed forces at a fraction of the price that it would otherwise cost the United States. Mm. So they looked at quite cynically, it's a pretty good investment for the United States. Um, and in the long term, geopolitically, of course, the United States wants to get back to the competition with China. Um, so thinking longer term, and some, some Americans are thinking this way, thinking longer term, if you help Ukraine to victory, then you have in Ukraine the lar largest uh, combat hard hardened army in, in Europe on the front line with Russia. You have a much more combat ready NATO, and therefore actually you, Europe is doing more for its own defense against Russia, which enables the United States all along to concentrate more on China. So I think there are both idealistic reasons, but also very hard reasons of, of realpolitik. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Natalia has a question. Thank you very much, Martin. And thank you, Timothy, for your insightful comments here. I can't help myself but to come back to a couple of your observations on the level of what you probably call historical sophie. Um, and I'm coming from the field of cultural anthropology, where we are very focused on the interplay between structure and agency, uh, individual will, and its contributions to historical and geopolitical picture overall. So you did mention, for example, the 1991 has happened because it was a convergence of so many uh, factors, so many processes. Where does the individual will, agency, and drive and I'm, of course, referring to political leadership, to, to powerful figures that they are, feature in your mind in these historical processes. And to me, I think it's, an, to me as an anthropologist, it's an important question to consider looking forward to what Russia may be after the war with respect to, again, the political figures there. 
where does so, individual fit into your understanding of history? So if anyone doubted the role of the individual in history, um, they should look at uh, Ukraine in 2022, 2023 and the role of President Zelensky, obviously, but they should also look at the end of the Cold War because none of that would have happened without the role of at least four or five quite exceptional individuals. The first is Mikhail Sergeyevich Gorbachev, self-evidently. If Comrade Romanov had got the job, it, it would be a completely different story. The second is um, Ronald Reagan, that quite extraordinary switch he made between being the ultimate Cold Warrior in his first term and the ultimate disarmer in his second term. Uh, thirdly, I would say Jacques Delors, because the dynamism of the West European project was extremely important in um, persuading East Europeans that the future lay with, with Western Europe, that that's what meant to be a normal country. And then I would say people like Václav Havel, Adam Michnik, Bronislav Geremek, Tadeusz Mazowiecki, who took the amber light, because it was only an amber light that Gorbachev had gave, and turned it into a green light. They drove through the amber light, if you will. So I think it, it massively illustrates the role of individuals in history, always, of course, interacting with structural, deeper structural factors. Thank you. There's one rule in our series that we're limited to one hour, and uh, we have already discussed one hour with Tim. If there isn't any uh, strong wish to come in with a question, uh, I would say thank you very much, Timothy. It was great to have you with us, and and. Uh, I, I'm looking forward to see you again at, in another discussion. Great pleasure. Thank Bravo you. So. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. Bye -bye.